I think I'm going to give you a little tiny bit of uh, background on some programming environment stuff because people are still having to deal with what to choose and they keep being told that these mythical Microsoft.net machines will arrive. So let's look at um, the alternatives. So five years ago, I guess, six years ago, um, Sun started promoting Java. I guess they couldn't make it work for what they wanted. It's, there's a book called The Innovator's <coughs> Dilemma, which basically says that nothing that's successful is ever successful for the reasons that the people who developed it thought it would be successful. And Java is a good example since it was developed for um, you know, handheld devices and home appliances and so forth. Um, anyway, I guess about five years ago, Sun started pushing it for um, client-side web applications, or six years ago, maybe. And then maybe three years ago, they started pushing it, or four years ago, for server-side uh, web applications. And finally, as of maybe a year ago, it seems to have become popular for this thing called J2E, which is kind of a conglomeration of stuff they already had all lumped together. And they say, okay, this is the way you should program with using these uh, 10 different services. Let me see what they lumped together actually here. Uh, this is a pretty good article. Servlets, Java server pages, enterprise Java beans, Java transactions, uh, a particular API to relational databases because when Java came out and people were using it initially, for web stuff, uh, there was no agreement on how you connected to the database. So for example, if you use Netscape application server and wrote a bunch of code that talked to a database, it wouldn't run in any other application server. So that's actually kind of a useful thing to standardize, although you wouldn't have thought it would be necessary to even say that. Interoperability with CORBA, so that means a Java object can call an object written in C++ or Common Lisp or something. Java naming and directory interface, I have no idea what that is. I suppose it's maybe some competitor to uh, LDAP. Um, Java Mail, I'm not sure what that is either. Uh, maybe it's the uh, mail implementation that Jin, <coughs> Jin used to build his uh, ACS-based uh, webmail system. XML, uh, again, I have no idea what that would mean. Um, maybe there's some standard libraries in Java for parsing it. There's actually, I saw a good article once in Info World, one of those magazines for corporate CIOs, and it was on the cover of Info World, I think it was, and uh, the headline was Java versus XML, presented as alternatives. So I always kind of like that. Um, anyway, I think the most interesting thing about Java is when you use enterprise Java beans plus container managed persistence plus an application server that implements it. If you look at a Perl CGI script, which is the most rudimentary form of uh, database-backed web app, what you generally find is a program that starts up, does some procedural logic, uh, sends some SQL to a relational database, gets the results back, merges them with an HTML string, and then ships the HTML string back out to the web browser. OK, that's all well and good. Um, <coughs> Notice that the programmer is writing Perl and writing SQL. You might think, well, what's wrong with that? Um, well, if you say programmers should only think of one object model, programmers should only have to think about one kind of data structure, then maybe it would be nicer if they could live in the object world all the time. So if they are programming in Java, they can create Java objects. And those that need to be persistent, which of course on the web are almost any objects need to be persistent, otherwise they're not accessible on the next page load. <coughs> um, we just mark those. We say, I would like this slot in this object to be persistent. And it's the job of the application server, in this case, WebLogic. There's some open source competitors listed down here as well, but WebLogic, I think, was the first that implemented this. Um, we'll make sure it's persistent. OK, well, how do you achieve persistence? You could try to be efficient and use an object database, but that would probably make people nervous if you said, oh, I'm using you know, this obscure object database that you've never heard of. Instead, people like to say, I'm using Oracle um, or some other relational database management system. So that effectively means that WebLogic is coming up with SQL updates and inserts as necessary behind the programmer's back. 
So the programmer can live in a world just of Java objects, mark certain ones as persistent, and magically it happens. So is that good or bad? Well, think about the fact that the $1,000 Pentium processor that you might have, actually you probably have an even cheaper one on your desktops. Anyway, whatever Pentium processor you have on your uh, desktops can probably do uh, a couple hundred million updates per second of an object's instance variable because it's just updating some RAM, uh, maybe doing a check or two. Uh, well, some of you may have noticed, but Oracle is not exactly the world's fastest application. You've been installing it. It takes forever to install. It seems to take a long time to create a database. And guess what? If you really benchmark it carefully, I bet you'd find that you were unable to get, um, even on a pretty big computer, more than a few hundred updates per second uh, through SQL. That's because uh, these relational database management systems are intended to process important transactions. They take a lot of care with each one. They write a bunch of stuff to disk. Oh, here's the stuff I'm about to do. Here's stuff that I've actually done. Now I mark it complete. All of this uh, is messing with the hard drive. And hard disks are you know, 100,000 times slower than memory or more. Um, actually, a lot more than that. So the result, the application now could be, so let's say I develop a Java object and I give that Java object to you. Um, you say, okay, I'm going to write a little loop. And I'm going to run around this loop and every, for every loop iteration, I'm going to call the set method on Phil G's Java object. Nothing wrong with that. You know, if you run around in the loop 10,000 times, it might not be, you know, the best and most efficient way to have implemented that system, but it certainly will be fast enough. Well, what happens if then I, without even telling you, and why should I tell you after all, say, okay, now I'm going to make some part of my object persistent. So all of a sudden your loop, instead of doing 10,000 sets into memory, is doing 10,000 SQL updates. And your application is running a million times slower than you expected. So there's two ways to approach this. Um, one way to approach this is to think, to talk to your other programmers, to look at the source code. Um, another way to approach this is to say, I'm just going to buy more processors and more disk drives and more memory and hope that the problem goes away. So if you're a big company and you're running an important application and some of the programmers who built it have quit and it's running too slowly, generally it is much easier just to talk to uh, the salespeople for whatever company supplies your database server and get a bigger database server than it is to go and elaborately debug this. So, is this a good feature or a bad feature of J2EE? So for the people who weren't at my one day seminar, let's ask some questions. What is the world's leading seller of Oracle servers, the hardware for Oracle servers? Any guesses? Sun, Sun. okay. Which company proposed the container managed persistence enterprise Java bean. <laughs> Very good. So uh, <laughs> anyway, basically, I tend not to be a huge fan of uh, Java because of what Sun advertises. They advertise these things as success stories. Here's a site. You know, let's say you want an information systems job with John Deere in Massachusetts, doing special technologies. See, it's a servlet. They proudly proclaim the uh, high quality of the service. I believe this is the submit button. <laughs> no job postings were found. All right, so let's go back and think about this user experience, which is very different from what I might expect at Google or AltaVista or typical search engines. Um, it's hard to type a query in those public search engines that'll get zero results. Um, first of all, look, in contrast to the photo.net Q&A forum archives, they don't tell us how many to expect. So wouldn't it be nice if you saw there was only one job in Arkansas, if you saw that there were a whole bunch of jobs in California? You have a clue as to whether it was worth searching at all or what to search on. Secondly, wouldn't it be nice if instead of giving us zero results, and look at the way they did the HTML, so if you, they broke the back button, right? If I back up, I've lost all my work. Um, that's the second issue. 
The third issue is why couldn't they have taken the three things that I said about the kind of job that I wanted and used those to score the jobs in the database and return the highest scoring matches, jobs that are in Massachusetts but perhaps aren't in special technologies, jobs that are in, um, where was that? I don't know, information systems but not in Massachusetts. So it's a terrible site. Should Sun be proud of them because they use servlets and because you can't back up out of the site? I don't know. Why? Who cares? I, I would rather that it was implemented with intelligence in Perl than uh, with this kind of really unfriendly user experience in Java. I don't know that much about the limits of Java, but it, uh, are the suggestions that you were proposing having the, the number of jobs per state, is it, would that not be possible with Java? Yeah, it's not possible with Java. Because if you wrote the thing yourself in Perl and you decided that it sucked, you can fix it in about an hour. Whereas if you had the thing written in Java, well, you have the users talk to the marketing people, you have the marketing people talk to the product manager, you have the product manager talk to the programming manager, you have the programming manager talk to the programmers in India, because only a professional programmer can mess with Java code, and then it goes all the way back. So it's true if it were a homebrew site, if it's like you know your home page running on your home box with a DSL line and you're you know a hardcore nerd and you're building everything yourself, you know, you can program everything in C++ or COBOL or something. Um, but as a practical matter, organizations that have Java websites built in Java tend to have a fairly long, they tend to have a fairly slow development cycle, which keeps them from adding the features that matter to users. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't think that's a high volume site, so it really wouldn't matter what they chose. The CGI, Cisco used to do $3 billion in business off of Cisco.com. Um, should they have been embarrassed because they use Perl CGI? I don't think so. $3 billion in orders is pretty good, even if you're a Perl loser. Um, <laughs> we'll show you. Uh, all right, let's move on. Anyway, there's some open source uh, J2E implementations that you guys might be interested in that do that container manage persistence. Tomcat is not one of them, sadly. Okay, what about .NET? Um, what's interesting about it? I think you have to step back and look at some of the things that, it's too bad that you guys are all so young, in your careers at least, you never had to struggle with the horrors of uh, C and really primitive languages like that. So you take some of the things in Java for granted even though you know, they were considered innovations uh, in the 60s or 70s or 80s when they were developed. So um, one of them is automatic storage allocation and garbage collection. This came in, I guess, with the first Lisp implementations starting in the late 50s and early 60s. So the idea is basically instead of, if you need a temporary data structure, um, you create it, and then when you're finished using it, the uh, system notices that you're done with that bit of storage and recovers it and puts it back into the free pool. So. Uh, a big source of bugs in C code is people allocating storage and forgetting to deallocate it so you have memory leaks that just grow. And every C program has memory leaks. Actually, there was this article I saw on the day in the life of the internet that talked about Solaris. It was a big day for Solaris. Sun was, this was a few years ago. Maybe they fixed some of these leaks. But anyway, Sun was promoting this as a great success story for Solaris. And the servers, the operating system itself was leaking a gigabyte per hour. So they had to, uh, you know, fatten these things up with huge amounts of disk and RAM, and then uh, every hour or two they had to reboot it to uh, <laughs> recover from the memory leak. Obviously, if it's just a regular old program leaking the memory, then you can restart the program. But if it's the operating itself, operating system itself, you have to reboot the machine. Secure execution environment for mobile code. So generally, the idea is that if you're running your browser, you can download a Java applet from some site and that the people who wrote that Java applet can't take over your machine. Um, enterprise Java beans supposedly permits plugging together lots of unrelated software components. So you can get components from 10 different people, plug them together, and you have some sort of application. Better support for modular and abstraction. So this is really um, the object system part of Java. So the idea is that you can abstract away the detail and achieve greater modularity by coming up with objects that only let you mess with them via advertised methods. 
So I think that Microsoft.net, one thing that's interesting about .NET is that it gives you these things with any computer language. So you can get almost all these benefits. I'm sh it, there is actually a COBOL implementation for Microsoft.NET, and I'm not sure that you really get wonderful modular and abstraction since COBOL isn't an object-oriented language if you're using COBOL. But except for uh, that, you get all these other features with any computer language. And if your language has an object-oriented feature, like uh, Perl does, I guess, Perl 5, the, the latest version of Visual Basic actually has the ability to deal with uh, classes, then you get all of these um, nice things about Java, but you're free to use whatever language you want. Um, and freedom to use whatever language you want is actually, I think this is, uh, so, so there's a couple of, features of .NET that make it easy to add new compilers. So for example, the act of writing the compiler itself usually isn't that big a deal. To translate source code into machine code is not that hard a problem. What tends to be hard about creating programming environments is the Windows systems, the debuggers, all the machinery that comes along with it. So one thing the .NET guys have done is they've pushed storage allocation and garbage collection down into the runtime environment, so it's at a lower level than any language can use. That's point one. Point two, they've published APIs to their development tools. So if you want to give somebody a fancy, um, you know, uh, visual C++ or visual basic development experience, you can get that in Lisp, for example, um, just by plugging your compiler into Visual Studio.net or whatever it's called. So I think that's pretty interesting and will lead to a lot more innovation. All right, subclasses across languages, as I mentioned yesterday. A component developer can build a class in C Sharp. A service developer who's on the front line with the users can create a subclass in Visual Basic that inherits its uh, behavior from the C Sharp superclass. Um, custom attributes on methods are very, very interesting. So a custom attribute on a method says, run this bit of code before or after this method is called on an object. And this is installed at the lowest level of .NET, so you can do this in any language. They have this security architecture, which lets you say things like, abort the call to this method if my caller isn't code signed by one of the following three people. Abort um, the execution of this method if my caller doesn't have write permission to a certain file in the operating system. So I think it's an interesting idea because that lets you separate security checks from the code itself. So uh, I could hire 10 programmers to write a big system and then one programmer to make sure that none of their code could be called by the wrong people. This is sort of the same thing I was talking about yesterday with web server filters where you, f you, where you assign the filtering to, you assign the security checks to a filter that runs on any URL that starts with a particular string uh, and not rely on the programmers to put security checks in each script. This gives you the same uh, feature, plus some more interesting stuff we'll talk about on the next slide. Metadata, oh, persistence. Uh, custom attributes can give you that container manage persistence-like feature. So you can say, uh, as somebody's calling this method, I also want you to do this SQL update over here. So if you want to do that you know, uh, heavy duty uh, relational database stuff behind another programmer's back, you can do it with custom attributes. You're going to, again, be subject to the same limitation. If you don't tell anyone that's what you're doing, and people who call these methods are suddenly say, God, this is a lot slower than I thought. Um, you know, start cursing Windows. That's another good thing. <laughs> can you put custom attributes on methods you didn't write? Yes, uh, that's a good question. Can you put custom attributes on methods you didn't write? Absolutely. So that's... Uh, yeah, that's sort of the whole point. Um, metadata for each software component loaded. So this is a big problem with enterprise Java beans. Um, if you load a bunch of enterprise Java beans, the syntax of the calls and the arguments may be the same, but the semantics may change uh, with version upgrades. So I'll give you an example of like a financial app and you're relying on um, a... Uh, application, you're relying on a Java bean to tell you the price of pork bellies. I, mean, I don't know if they have pork bellies in France. This is the example I always give. I hope they do have pork belly, pork belly futures in France. So uh, it's giving you francs, prices in francs, 
but you know, one day the version is upgraded and it's giving you francs and euros. So the rest of your code thinks, oh, pork bellies are now really cheap in France. Um, they're seven times cheaper than anywhere else. So I'm going to go and buy, you know, $100 million worth of them. Um, in the .NET world, they say, okay, this is kind of a problem. Maybe we should keep track of the version of these deployment units. They call them assemblies. Uh, what other assemblies it depends on, security permissions needed to run, so that when they're all glommed together in a new build, uh, you, can do, you can warn people, hey, there's a new version of this thing that might not be compatible. Um, all right, plus they developed this new computer language just to piss off Sun, uh, C Sharp. It is better than Java in that, I don't know how many of you guys thought this was annoying. <laughs> yes. What? <laughs> what? <Amen>. Yeah. <laughs> so let me give you the history. The history about, I don't know if you got this in your Java course, so stop me if I'm repeating something you've already heard. The history of object-oriented languages is that really good ones are produced, ones that are great for users. And the example, the er example of this is Smalltalk. So Smalltalk was developed in the mid-70s at Xerox Park. It was objects all the way down. You could send a message to a number to tell it to go fuck itself or print itself or whatever else you wanted to do. And you could send the same message to a high-level object like a window. Uh, it was objects all the way down. So then people said, well, I want, like, actually, Lisp, the Lisp programmer said this at first. They said, well, we want all these object features from Smalltalk, but uh, Lisp at the time could be compiled into code that ran as fast as Fortran. And they couldn't figure out how to make their um, Earth, their uh, numerics run as fast as Fortran in a Lisp where every number was an object as well. So they said, okay, we'll have some primitive types and we'll have some uh, objects and they're not really going to be. Lisp <coughs> fortunately isn't quite as lame as Java in the sense that you can build, you could always build lists that mixed and matched, you know, so you could build a list of say, three things that were primitives and three things that happened to be objects. But it was still kind of annoying, and it wasn't as convenient, for, especially for novice users. It's very hard to explain to somebody who's never programmed before. I mean, think about why Perl and Tickle are so easy for people to learn. You don't have to, since everything's a string anyway, you don't have to explain to them about a type system. Well, it's bad enough when you have to explain to them about a type system, but how do you explain to somebody, oh, well, you know, when you want a number, you use int, and when you want a number, you use big int. <laughs> uh, it's not clear how that really works. So there have been, I believe, common lists switched to this finally. Uh, maybe after about five, six years, they came up with ways of uh, achieving, by making the compiler more complex, achieving high performance with primitives equivalent to what they had before, and also uh, letting the user see everything as an object. So that's what Microsoft has done with C-sharp. The Java implementers were lazy. They said, we don't want to have to work too hard on the compiler. So um, we'll push this complexity onto the user. <coughs> At Microsoft, they said, well, you know, we've got really good programmers. And um, so what we'll do is we'll just work the compiler developers harder, and we'll shield this distinction from the user. And numbers will work as numbers when they have to be fast and they'll work as objects when the uh, programmer wants to see them as objects. So uh, there's this, if you want to be an open source purist, HP, Intel, Microsoft, and IBM took their common language infrastructure and C Sharp and sent them up to ECMA, which I guess is the European standards group, sort of like ANSI, but um, they're a little more nimble, for ultimate ISO standardization. So basically, they're trying to put this stuff more or less in the public domain. Uh, you could sit down at your Linux box and implement .NET without paying Microsoft a dollar. So that's the idea. Now, that was also true with some of the Java stuff, but it took a couple of years after WebLogic for Jonas and JBoss to come out. So I don't think you're going to be programming 100% open source .NET anytime uh, in the next few months. Although maybe IBM will come up with something since they seem to be into that these days. All right. Um, so in deciding whether you want to invest even 10 minutes in looking at .NET, you really have to ask yourself, do you think computer languages matter? Because if you don't think computer languages matter, I think that you shouldn't bother looking at .NET. The other features probably aren't interesting enough. Um, 
So if you believe that you know you can just write everything in Java, and that 20 years from now you'll be able to write everything in Java without um, any loss, then um, you know stick probably to the Java tools because they're more mature. However, you have to ask yourself, um, Java as a computer language, what has it done for you? We're now in year seven of the Java rev revolution. Do you find that computers are working better than they used to? Are your applications more reliable? Do things configure themselves? Maybe it's good that things don't configure themselves. I always like to say that if Sun, Microsoft, and Oracle products either worked simply or simply worked, half the people in the IT industry would be out of jobs. But um, that may not be much comfort to you as you're trying to install Oracle. Um, I think Oracle, I think that installer, I think that horrible Oracle installer is implemented in Java, actually. Yeah, Oracle, it's funny. I hope they never see this videotape. Uh, there's, I think, six different web, I think there's five different web, browse, web servers that have been developed in Oracle, all the way down to the HTTP protocol. Um, so there's all these groups in Oracle that have developed their own web servers. And the only group in Oracle that actually should have built its own little web server and a web-based application, which is the installer group, didn't. Instead, they built that horrible Java thing. Try running that over the net. You think it's slow on your local machine? Try running that Java window stuff when the server is in California and you're uh, viewing it from an X server in uh, Boston. OK. Um, basically, the thing about Java is that it hasn't created new programs or new programmers. We haven't, Java hasn't enabled new kinds of programs that didn't exist before. And it, doesn't it hasn't enabled a new class of programmer. In other words, people who could program successfully in C are programming successfully in Java. People who could not program successfully in C have not been able to suddenly, oh, now I have Java. All of a sudden, I'm not a loser anymore. I can write any code that I want. Um, ditto for the wizards of Java. Somebody who's a wizard in Java, if you took away Java and gave him uh, or her Common Lisp or C++, you know, they might grumble for a while, but eventually they would probably go back to roughly the same programs uh, at roughly the same level of productivity. Um, contrast this with VisiCalc and its successors. Uh, as we talked about yesterday, the spreadsheet enabled a huge class of people, uh, tens of millions of people, to program even though they didn't think of themselves as programmers. So this is the kind of revolution that you have to look for, and Java ain't it. Um, the web explosion, scripting languages all the way. So in the 80s, I guess, you know, most of the people creating computer applications were professionally educated computer programmers. Those were the only people who could create computer applications. When the web came along, you know, you had all kinds of people creating um, I don't know what you would call a static HTML site. I don't know, a computer experience anyway, with no programming uh, effort or experience at all. And then you had people kind of dipping their toe into the programming water with uh, scripting languages. And an awful lot of people were able to build pretty significant things despite not having a programming background. Slashdot is, is a canonical example. Two guys who could not program built Slashdot, which is a very sophisticated online community. It works a lot better than that crummy John Deere site, which was programmed by you know expert programmers in the fanciest tools. Um, you know, when they open sourced their code, uh, the world of professional programmers gagged. They said, "My God, this is the worst Perl." You know, I don't know how you really evaluate that. This is the worst Perl code we've ever seen in our lives. Um, well, it was because they weren't programmers. But so what? It's a good user experience. Um, and enable their, their community to scroll uh, to scale relatively gracefully. So that's going down, 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 getting more people into the programming fold, which I think is an interesting thing to do. And it's not going to happen with Java. And it might well happen with .NET, because .NET is much, much friendlier to the world of scripting languages than uh, the Java world. Because um, if you're programming in VB, you're not a second class citizen. Contracts, let's go up now into fancier languages than Java. So Java is not a bad condensation of good computer language ideas from, like I said, the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s. Uh, there are better ideas, though. If you go to Eiffel.com, I don't know, was Eiffel covered anywhere this term? 
Okay, so Eiffel is um, at, well, see, you guys are suffering. You're, t you're getting the crummy MIT curriculum. So most people think, you know, so Scheme is, uh, it's got some good ideas from, uh, that course is 25 years old now, I think. 22 years old. There has been progress. If you go to a good university, um, you will not learn Scheme. You will learn Eiffel, Haskell, or ML probably as a first computer language. So let's just talk about Eiffel for a second. You guys can go at your leisure to Eiffel.com. I happen not to like these languages because they have a forest of syntax like Java. I do tend to prefer languages like Lisp personally, uh, but these features could be implemented with Lisp syntax. Unfortunately, they haven't been. Anyway, Eiffel has invariants, preconditions, and postconditions. So here's an example. In Eiffel, if you're running a banking application, you can put in an invariant saying, run my code, but raise an error if I do anything that would cause the user's account balance to be different from the sum of all previous transactions. That would be an invariant. Let me give you a post condition. You can say, run this code. Let's suppose it's code to let a user uh, update his or her um, registration at a website. You can say, up, oh, run this code, but if the code results for any reason in the user having a blank password or a password less than three characters, abort execution. So that's kind of an interesting thing that can protect you against a whole lot of programming bugs because you separately, you separately specify what's most important. Here's stuff, don't run me unless the following preconditions are met. Don't run me, uh, undo what I just did if uh, at the end of what I've done the world is an unhappy place. ML style reasoning about types. So if you choose to pursue the Java, the one true Java path this semester, I can sort of guarantee you what your code will look like. Um, everything that you query from the relational database management system will come to you through the C API or the JDBC or whatever, pretty much as a string. So I'll be querying all these strings from the database and you will be writing all these strings out to the web browser. So I predict that your Java code will contain, um, by the end of the term, I suspect that you will have a thousand or more occurrences of string space in your Java code. So a thousand times or more, you will be telling Java this variable is a string, okay? What if you did that with Lisp? Well, if you did that with Lisp, at runtime, it would figure out what these things were. So it would read from the database, aha, this is a string. Um, and then when you were combining it with something from the database, uh, from a, a template, it would say, okay, if I add two strings together, I get a string as a result. And then if you wrote that out to the web browser, it would say, okay, well, I'm now giving a string to the uh, printing API or whatever. So, um, you would save yourself all of that laborious effort. Well, you saw that in Scheme, basically. You didn't have to keep telling Scheme what these things were. It just figured it out on the fly. Problem with that is it tends to be a little bit slow. Uh, can slow you down a little bit, checking to make sure that you're not doing something unsafe, like adding a string to a number. And you can get surprised. So if you write an application um, that has a statement like we talked about, um, maybe we didn't talk about this history, if you write an imperative program um, in, well, and that's your, really your only choice in Lisp, uh, and you say, if it's after March 27th, 2003, do the following operations, um, you really don't know what's gonna happen then. One of the things that could happen then is a string could get added to a number and an error could be raised at runtime. You're not gonna have a garbage result like you might in a language like C, which is totally unsafe. Um, you won't have corrupt data, but you will have you know, the user's scaring in an error message. Okay, so ML is a more advanced language in many ways than Scheme. And one of the things that it does is it can reason about types. So it can look at your whole program and it can figure out, um, here's some arbitrary user input, which is not constrained. Um, and 500 procedure calls and steps later over in this other function that you never thought about, that gets added. Let's say you prompt the user for uh, his or her age. 
So you think it's a number and you treat it as such. Um, most of the time, most of the time you're just printing it out. But somewhere 500 procedure calls later, that number is getting added or averaged or something. And ML is smart enough to say, there's a potential type problem here because the user could type a string uh, or could type something that wasn't a number in response to that, and then you'd be uh, putting that into the average function. It doesn't make sense to take the average of a string uh, with a bunch of other numbers. So it'll warn you about problems like that. And similarly, if you write all your web scripts in ML, it can say, OK, anything that comes from the database API has to be a string. There's all these strings that are statically in the text uh, of my uh, system. And uh, I know that I'm not going to have a type problem. I'm going to be able to combine these, and I'll get strings as a result. So again, I think that that may become a dominant programming style, because people might just get sick of all these strings. All right, so that's a little guide to .NET. I'm going to talk about one more thing. I've never heard of ML before. Where can I find that? Well, it is linked. Um, oh, yeah. okay. Bell Labs. Standard ML of New Jersey. <laughs> this, is, uh, this could be uh, the introduction to a book on why everybody needs a marketing department. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, uh, Eiffel.com is a little, little jazz here, being French. The richest software technology resources on the internet. More than 1,200 pages of solid technical information on how to boost quality and productivity. Notice that they don't include the word leading. <laughs> They're not the leaders in uh, boosting quality and productivity. They merely are providing you 1,200 web pages on doing it. So they, too, need, I guess, a modern uh, marketing department. And they will be the leaders. Um, OK, so one of the things that we're going to be talking about more this semester, uh, and this really cuts across programming environments, but is support for Nouvelle Internet applications, so web servers that invoke services and pull content from other web servers. So the degenerate example of this is you know, the Bill Gates personal wealth clock, which took about an hour to write, but is still more representative. It's pulling the stock price for Microsoft from NASDAQ. It's pulling the US population from the Census Bureau. And it's combining those to figure out that you've personally contributed $219 to uh, Bill Gates' personal wealth. But now you're getting it back, I hope, today. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I had to actually update this. I said I wrote this in 95 as an example for MIT students of the future of web services. I said, ironically, this approach to distributed computing over the internet was ignored by most of the rest of the world, except for one company, Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, the interesting way that you're going to be thinking about web stuff this term is that you have to think about object-oriented program. We talked about this before. Well, let's reiterate. What is an object? An object is something that has storage, but won't let external programs directly modify its state variables. So let's go to the Census Bureau and think of this as an object. The object's name is census.gov. The method that we invoked was called slash CGI bin slash pop clock. And this is a true object in the sense that because these guys aren't losers and left out the file extensions, we have no idea how they implemented this. They could have written it in C. They could have written it in Perl. It could be in Tickle. It could be in ML, standard ML of New Jersey. Um, and they could change their implementation strategy. That is good object-oriented practice. Uh, there were no arguments to this uh, method, but there could have been. You'd see those on the you, on a request line with a question mark, variable name equals whatever. Uh, also, the output comes back in a slightly un friendly to computer programs form. And it's a human readable web page that has to be parsed. But this is still object-oriented programming. This, is an op this, is, this program regards the census.gov server as an object, invokes a method on it to pull out that population. This is the way that more and more applications are going to be um, developed. It is a lot nicer when the data come back in machine-readable form rather than human-readable form. 
And that's what XML is all about. A printed representation for structured data. Um, it is even nicer if the data are represented in an XML format agreed upon by lots of people. So one problem with XML, there's two problems. First of all, it doesn't say anything about semantics. So if you see um, you know, price as an XML tag, you have no idea whether that's dollars, francs, euros, uh, or anything else. So there's nothing about semantics. Um, and then a, a sort of more annoying problem, but perhaps just as serious, is that if you're getting an array back in XML format, there's no agreed way to represent an array of information. Um, another problem is that objects should be self-describing. Um, what does that mean? That means you ought to be able to ask an object, what methods do you support? Right? You shouldn't have to know that, oh, at census.gov, I go to slash CGI bin slash popcock. You should be able to go to, in, 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 in the old common list days 20 years ago, the method was called which operations. You could send an object a message, which operations, and you would get back a list of uh, all the methods that were supported by that object aside from which operations. I don't know, if maybe which operations was also on the list. So in the web world, that's web service description language. Um, both SOAP and WSDL were initially developed by Microsoft. They've now been standardized by the web consortium. Um, you can reach distributed computing nirvana if you have a way to discover resources and services. So one reason the wealth clock, the wealth clock was broken all day Sunday. You might say, well, you're a pretty lousy programmer, Greenspun. I wonder. Um, it was broken, though, because the Census Bureau site was throwing errors. Um, well, I don't know of any other source of US population data. But wouldn't it be nice if I could go to the UDDI registry and ask it, where in the world can I get population statistics and have it give me lists of servers? And then for each server, I can get um, a WSCL description of which methods it supports. So basically, this is what you need to implement to true distributed computing over the internet. We're going to talk about this in much more detail uh, as the rest of the term wears on. But I'm talking about this a bit because I believe that .NET has superior support for this style of computing. A lot of these standards were developed by Microsoft. Um, a lot of the folks who built .NET came from the MIT Lab for Computer Science and the Web Consortium, so they were explicitly attacking this problem and trying to make it easy to build services like this. And Microsoft itself has built a bunch of services that are like this, like Hailstorm is the most recent. So I think that you'll find that you know, you'll have to write less code yourself if you use .NET and you want to do SOAP and so forth. Question? What's UDDI? I wish I knew. Uh, UDDI is this place. I'm not sure how well it really works. It's one central site. It's sort of like DNS. It's a central site that you can go to Universal Description, Discovery, and Integration of Business for the Web. It's intended for business data. But I guess the idea is you can, your program can come here and find you know, all the places that will uh, trade pork bellies or uh, all the places that can give currency prices and so forth. So it's a way to discover uh, resources on the web. Um, just as, um, well, yeah. Like I said, if you know that you want to talk to census.gov, but you don't know what method to invoke, WSCL is the right thing. If you don't even know, if you know that you want population statistics, but you don't know that you should talk to census.gov, you need UDDI. As like I said, I don't know if it, I don't know if it's really filled with anything useful. I'm just saying that it's an example of an attempt, at least. Don't they just calculate the population? They, yeah, it's just a simple calculation. Yeah, so you can just calculate it and you wouldn't have to know. I don't, they don't really make their source code available. I guess they make their formula available. But you know, I only spent an hour writing the program, and you know, it might be more complicated than that. They might actually be online with the hospitals and so forth. In an improved, <laughs> in an improved in the cemeteries. <laughs> I mean, the, the point is, you know, the the world's getting away from these monolithic services. Like Photo.net is like that. It's an island. 
we're not online with anyone. If there's a press release at Nikon or Canon, well, you know, get your ass over there to the Canon or Nikon website and you surf it for yourself. I mean, it would be nice. Photo.net could be substantially improved if it actually pulled information from other sites as appropriate. Like Phil Askey, right? There's this guy, Phil Askey, in England who reviews every new digital camera. And it'd be awfully nice if, you know, when he had a new review that showed up as an item on photo.net so that you could uh, click through from there. But, you know, we don't do it because it's too much trouble. And Phil Askey doesn't exactly make it easy when he comes up with a new review. He just, you know, posts it on his site in some idiosyncratic HTML format. But, like I said, I think people are getting, this is becoming a more and more common approach. All right, let's go back to the textbook. So speaking of the textbook, I've heard that there is some heresy with the TAs posting alternative oracle exercises. The TAs are there to help you do the exercises in the book. They're not there to write them. They're there also to help you write examples in application workbook. So this is the URL for the text. I hope you have it somewhere. Yes, everybody has it. So basically, all you have to do is these. What I'm asking the TAs to do is, um, for example, there's some cases where there's pseudocode. Um, yeah, there's some cases where there's pseudocode. Like well, the wealth clock could be regarded as pseudocode, although it's actually in tickle. Source code. Um, Anyway, I'm basically asking them to do things like translate that into uh, supplements. So if you're using, you know, if, if a whole bunch of people want to use .NET, there's going to be a .NET version of the wealth clock that would that would just run that you can use as a model for the stuff that you're building. Um, so that's what they're there for. So hassle them. They're not there to like rewrite these examples. That's a waste of your time and theirs. So in theory, all you should have to do is read through this book, follow some of the links, and do the problems as spec. Um, all right, so you'll be pleased to know that should you get bored doing this one or should you get stuck, there's a whole other problem set to do now. So I finished this chapter yesterday. Um, and this is something to do probably in parallel with the other one. It's basically planning your service. So let's go through this just a little bit. Um, basically, the idea is to build an online learning community. Um, so pick a group and then pick a topic. Um, and I basically, in this problem set, would like everybody to do some planning and competitive analysis. So first you have to say who's going to teach what to whom and what alternatives are currently available for this kind of learning and what's good about them. So let me uh, give you some examples on photo.net. Well, okay, so first you have to divide your users into classes. You can't deal with one user at a time. That's too difficult. You have to come up with some way to treat users in groups uh, and then build software to support a user like that. So I think it is the case that two users fall into the same class if you expect them to want substantially the same experience with your service. Um, so that means that an administrator and a user almost always want different experiences of the site. Uh, that's a useful distinction to look at different levels of administrative privileges because they are going to be doing different things on the site. But I think it's almost never useful to look at teachers versus learners. That's not a useful distinction because the whole point of the online community is that each user is at sometimes asking questions and at sometimes answering questions. So I don't think that's a productive way to look at the decomposition. I'm giving you a concrete example of user class decomposition on photo.net. Um, I don't know that it's the best one necessarily but at least it is precise. So the overall objective is a place where a person can go and get the answer to any question about photography. So that's what I want to be able, I, that's what I want people to say after they've left photo.net. I got my answer, my question answered. Um, so you want to have an idea of the site purpose. At levels of administrative privilege. Um, in photo.net, I posit three, three classes, site-wide administrators who can edit, or delete, they can create new topics, they can create new contests, they can um, delegate some of their authority to other users. We have moderators, and a moderator works just within, say, one subsection, like a, Q, a particular Q&A forum, like the Nature Q&A forum. So all they can do is uh, edit or delete uh, or approve postings in that forum. 
and then regular users, and the regular users just read, post, and edit their own contributions. Okay, that's the first way to divide the user experience. The second way to divide users is uh, by their purpose in visiting the site. So we have, you know, somebody wants to be a point and shooter, somebody who uh, wants to exhibit their photos, somebody who wants to know about travel. Um, <coughs> I think it's also productive to divide the users by how they're going to connect. Um, so you may want to say, okay, what am I giving for the web user? What am I giving for the WAP user? And what am I giving for somebody who's on a voice telephone connection? Then you come up with usage scenarios for what each person would do at the site. So I have just a couple here, one for a novice photographer shopper, one for a site-wide administrator. So come up with something like that, like what, what happens when they arrive at the site? So I say, this is very precise on the site-wide administrator. The site-wide administrator logs in, immediately sees a page that gives the pulse of the community with statistics on who's registered, how many pe people have uploaded photos, the activity in the discussion forum, um, if there's unbanned users who've been responsible for an onerous amount of moderator work, uh, those people should be highlighted right there on the page and offered up for banning. Has that been a big problem? No, not a big problem. I'm just saying that's how it should work. Get rid of them quickly. That's not, in fact, how it works on Photo.net, you know. But if we had, if we rethought it carefully, you know, allow me to dream. <laughs> One of the few luxuries of writing this book. Uh, okay, so there's an exercise here um, to answer some of these questions. And um, I link to a web consortium document on a multimodal interface, which you might find stimulating as you think about uh, what would happen if somebody could both talk and look at, uh, say, WAP decks at the same time. Evaluate offline alternatives. So basically, the popular offline alternatives may be really refined because they are old. Like Popular Photography Magazine is 65 years old. And uh, you know the fact that it's been successful over so many years means they've, they're doing some things right. So we say it's really good at answering some questions about you know, what, what, how, much do, how much do the latest cameras cost. It's very ineffective for start to finish learning. That's actually a good thing to find out about an offline alternative. It's nice if you can say, hey, my online thing is going to be better in the following ways. Uh, and it's not hard to be better than a magazine because magazines can't do anything long. Right? They can't publish a 20-page story because to publish a 20-page story, they have to sell 10 pages of ads. And uh, it's just too hard. Um, you can't get answers to arbitrary questions because it takes too long. You mail your question in, they pick it out of a pile of maybe 100, they answer four, and you're only getting answers from their editors. And if you look at the pictures that have been taken by their editors, you can see that you know, they're not necessarily the world's greatest photographers. Um, it's ineffective as a means of exhibiting your work. You can send them your photo, and they pick it up again. They, they publish five or six reader-contributed photos in every issue. Face-to-face uh, -face course. So, you know, think about what's good and what's bad about the face-to-face -face course. So here's something that, again, I wish we had a stronger emphasis of in Photo.net. We have availability of critiques relatively recently. You couldn't get that on Photo.net before, and it's been hugely popular. So if we had done this analysis, if I'd only had this book when I started, um, I would have realized that I should look at what works great about a face-to-face -face photography course, what's better about taking a course than about sitting by yourself. And fundamentally what's better is that you have this structured mentoring relationship. The instructor is responsible for keeping track of your open questions and answering them. So we could have built that in Photo.net, and we still should. You know, when you sign up, you should be assigned a couple mentors who are experienced members of the community who see what your questions are. That's A. And B, you get critiques from the other students and from uh, the instructor. And when we added critiques to Photo.net, if you look at the unified forum, I think you'll see that the images posted for critique dwarf the uh, number of other questions. So, you know, most people, I don't know, if they can't figure out how to turn their Nikon on, they can read the manual. <laughs> But the one thing they can't get sitting at home with their Nikon manual, the Nikon isn't going to tell them, oh, I really like that picture you just took. Uh, nor is the manual going to tell them that. So that's an example where I wish we'd thought more carefully when we started. Um, OK, evaluating alternatives online. Uh, I've talked about this some in my one-day course. And some of you guys can pick it up from 
maybe some other stuff that I've written. But basically, there's these six principles, I think, of sustainable online community. You have to have magnet content authored by experts, or at least people that the readers will accept as experts. Um, something that uh, you can't just rely on the readers to talk to each other. You have to provide more than an empty room. Means of collaboration, a way for users to talk to each other. Uh, powerful facilities for searching and browsing. Uh, is it possible to look through both what the publisher has authored and what the readers have authored? Um, it's going to be hard for you to tell how moderation is delegated at these sites. In some cases, like Slashdot, you can see that uh, they will delegate moderation down to the readers. In a lot of cases, it's hard to tell whether it's one person moderating everything or a uh, distributed group. Means of exclusion, unless you want to post a bunch of really nasty stuff on a site, it's going to be a little bit hard for you to tell you know, how they exclude difficult people, although I guess you could look at some of the gateways that they have on registration. Means of software extension by community members themselves. Uh, again, things like Java tend to be unfriendly for that. If you see a .asp or a .pl extension, you know, and then you're pretty sure they're using some kind of scripting language. Um, so I basically ask you guys to look at some of the best online communities that you can find in your subject area and uh, figure out how they're doing along these dimensions. Also look for voice and WAP interfaces and try them out. If you don't want to run up your WAP bill, we link to an article here in uh, Ars Digita Systems Journal that itself links to some online emulators. So you can actually sit in a web browser and get a little picture of an Ericsson R380 phone, which is actually deceptive because it's got a huge screen, um, and uh, play around with somebody's WAP interface without uh, waiting and paying for your wireless vendor. Um, don't be discouraged. What if you find there's already 100 online communities in your subject area? Well, I searched at Amazon for aquarium, and I found there are 679 books on how to keep a home aquarium. Um, and there's 4,000 colleges in the US, just about. Um, so your experience, your gut feeling, because you're in the computing world, may be that there's only room for one or two. You know, There's only room for two desktop operating systems. Uh, it used to be Mac and Windows. Now it seems to be Windows and Linux. Um, there's only room for a couple word processors. <laughs> There's only room for um, you know, a few relational database management systems. But it's totally the opposite in the world of online communities. And one factor is uh, the idiosyncras idiosyncrasy of authorship. You, know, you might have a book that you think is the best book in the world, but you don't just read that same book over and over again. This is why it's much lower risk to write a book than a word processor program. If my word processor is better than Microsoft Word and I can somehow get it bundled on every computer sold, um, you know, maybe I have a chance of unseating word. But I don't have to write a better novel than Anna Karenina in order to get some people to read my novel. Because people can't just read Anna Karenina over and over and over and over again. They will get bored. Same with movies. Same with tutorial materials, although, again, you're more constrained. If you're really idiosyncratic and non-narrative, you know, in your approach to teaching photography, you may find that, you know, that puts off some readers in a way that, uh, you know, like the English patient was able to find an audience despite the fact that it's not very well organized. Um, all right, the movie's not so bad though. It's a lot easier to understand the book. Um, the second force is more powerful. Raise your hand if you've read a pattern language. Nobody's read a pattern language? All right, you have to go, I'll go do that. Um, it's called, uh, it's a pattern language, Christopher Alexander. Um, it will enormously increase your respect for architects. Most people think of architects as just people who design really unpleasant to use buildings. But uh, actually, this will show you that architects actually draw from sociology, psychology, and anthropology. And the best of them are really great thinkers. So this fellow, Christopher Alexander, um, this is a book that's worth owning. It's a small book, and it's full of individual ideas. I'll just give you one idea to show you how thoughtful this book is. Um, they say that you have to have light from two sides of every room. That any room that has windows, that if you look in your house and you think, which are the good rooms, the only rooms that you will think are good are ones that have windows on at least two sides. Because if there's windows on only one side, the light will always be too contrasty because it's only coming from one direction. So think about the houses you've lived in. 
Um, and that's something that you know I wouldn't have thought of. Um, another idea that uh, he also talks about public squares. He says the only public squares are only the only squares that are tolerable in public places are ones where you can see the faces of other people in the square. So as soon as you get to those communist scales or like the Washington DC mall, the spaces become unworkable because you know, if you see these little stick figures way, way in the distance, that makes you uncomfortable. And the only way to make a big public square that works, he says there are some examples in Italy where there's long and narrow public squares where effectively they have you know, cafes here, cafes there, cafes there, and people, people like those reasonably well. But otherwise, you have to keep them pretty small. Um, so another thing that he says you have to keep smaller countries. He says you can't have more than 2 to 10 million people in a country. That basically, in a population of n persons, there are of the order of n squared person-to-person -person links needed to keep channels of communication open. Um, when n goes beyond a certain limit, the channels of communication needed for democracy and justice and information are simply too clogged and too complex. Bureaucracy overwhelms human process. Um, beyond the size of 10 million or 2 million, people could become remote from the large-scale processes of government. Um, our estimate may seem extraordinary in the light of modern history. The nation states have grown mightily and their governments hold power over tens of millions, sometimes hundreds of millions of people. But these huge powers cannot claim to have a natural size. Their tendency has been to repress local culture, at the same time aggrandize themselves to the point where they are out of reach, their power barely conceivable to the average citizen. <laughs> so this is what happens in online communities also although I'm not sure that AOL's power is barely conceivable to the average user, uh, but it's too big. If it worked to pile everybody into one online community, then AOL would have everything. Uh, they have a subject interest you know, subsection on almost every topic, and there, wouldn't, there would be no photo.net. There would be the photo section of AOL only. Um, I think that uh, even if you find 100 online communities, on your particular topic, you have to consider the fact that there's, you know, five or six billion people, six billion people in this world. There's a lot of people in this world, and they can't all pile into even the existing ones. That basically, unless we're going to talk later in the semester about techniques for scaling things and getting big, but generally the really good communities are usually considered relatively small. AOL is not considered by most people to be, you know, a shining example of a great community experience. Um, all right, that's it, and there is no more. Um, all right, so questions? I'm, I'm going to try to keep the lectures reasonably short this term, and as you guys actually accomplish stuff, devote more and more of the time to, you know, uh, students presenting rather than me <coughs> talking, because this is a lab course, not a lecture and theory course. Uh, just on the web clock, um, did you effectively pass that census thing as one enormous string? Yes, through the magic of regular expression technology. Right. Um, so it's not an object in that sense. If they, if they kind of put another word in. Oh, it's an object in that sense, in the sense that if I give you my object and I tell you what the method is and then I change the semantics underneath, I can still break your code. So I think it's about as encapsulated as two Java objects are in the sense that you can't see how I've chosen to implement it and I can still screw you over. It's just that um, I would probably have to intentionally, you know, I would probably have to have more malice to screw you over with two Java objects. The Census Bureau can screw me over, yeah. you know, while imagining that they're improving life for the users by making a clearer presentation. Um, and they have. I've had to change the regex maybe two, two or three times in the last six years. How do you know how many shares they have? I got that off of a public SEC filing, and I note in there that I don't adjust it. So you don't go to his broker? No. <laughs> Can you just talk for a minute about what you're doing right now? What I'm doing what? <laughs> With my life? What I'm doing when I'm not here? I'm writing this goddamn book. <laughs> you think it's easy? No. <laughs> to cut and paste? I got a carpal tunnel. No. <laughs> um, what am I doing? Um, I've rethought, as you saw from that teaching software engineering paper, which also, thank you very much, took a bit of time to write, um, our approach to pedagogy. Um, I am trying to formulate a research uh, agenda at this new research lab 
um, at France Telecom in Orange, which is going pretty slowly because the infrastructure, you know, we, we have this building that we've rendered in East Cambridge, but they keep having to, first they said they had to redo the ceiling, then they said they had to redo the floor. <laughs> so they're spending $4 million. It's, IT world's better than the construction world because if you want to spend $4 million in the IT world, you can just buy packaged junkware, a couple sunboxes, and you're done, maybe after a month. Uh, but in the world of construction, it apparently takes almost a year or more to spend $4 million. <laughs> so that's not going to be ready till September. We have a temporary building we just moved into. Things are going slowly, but you know, one thing I learned from Ars Digita is that you know, reprising my asshole role from Ars Digita might not be a good idea. So instead of yelling at people, I want that infrastructure up. I want a phone on my desk. I want a computer on my desk. If there's no phone on my desk or computer on my desk, I just go home and write some more from my home computer. <laughs> I'm mellowing. <coughs> Um, so the second thing I'm trying to do is, okay, so another thing we're trying to do is some interesting, contribute to some systems at MIT for peer-to-peer -peer education. So basically we've got this idea for a research project. I'll actually, actually you guys are, you guys contributed to this. If you go to philip.greenspun.com slash dev, this is my secret development directory for, as you can see, it's very well protected. Um, <laughs> Homework and tutoring support system. So we're trying to get MIT, Microsoft, research, because they have money and uh, community experts, and Orange Cambridge Research Lab, because Orange slash France Telecom will have uh, me and Jin, um, to come up with a system where there's uh, a tutoring coach that keeps track of which students are working on what projects at what time. Um, so that you can, uh, if you get stuck at 12 midnight or one in the morning on problem set three, exercise four in your physics class, you can find other students who just finished that one and get help from them. And there's all these tutors at MIT, there are student tutors who are you know, a little more advanced. Um, but, and they can get paid, but the tutoring can only happen at certain times and in certain places. And we're trying to pr create an infrastructure where an alumnus or one of these student tutors can get paid or recognized for their tutoring effort um, and do it in a more ad hoc fashion. And so this is a pretty big project. If we, if we get it uh, off the ground, it's going to require you know, an MIT staff member or two who have nothing else to do other than publish and promote the service and service the customers. So I'm trying to get this up and running. Also, I assume, I hope you've been reading the textbook. Uh, that diet coach thing, I'm trying to actually build that, Jin and I. I don't know why we're so interested in this. <laughs> So we think that's kind of a cool example of an orange thing. Um, but um, yeah, so that's what I'm up to. Um, I'm going to the Hong Kong web conference in May and then uh, probably be hanging around most of the summer. And Ars Digital Prize, we're doing Ars Digital Prize again this year, finally. <laughs> Got that sorted out. First it was off, now it's on. There's Tracy. Thanks to Tracy, it's back on. So that's what I'm up to. But I'll, happy to get, I'll be happy to get this book. I think this book will have a lot more impact than the last book because the last book, I think I mentioned this, was, was too technical for uh, most business people and it wasn't well enough organized for a university course. Basically, you had to read the entire book before you could sit down and do problem set one. And that's just not how you know, most universities like to work. It was too much burden on the students and too much on the instructors. So only 15 schools adopted uh, 6916. And I guess the book has been used quite a bit in other schools, especially since it's available online. But um, you know, if the student only spends a day or two reading a chapter or two, I'm not sure how much impact that really has. So I'm kind of excited about this book. And I'm hiring people, lots of people. I have to hire like 20 people for the Orange Lab. So if anybody, if any of you guys want to be really lazy and just do research, <laughs> uh, at the end of the year, you can holler. But uh, yeah, so we'll hire a bunch of, I think we're going to hire, um, we're going to hire for each research project, we'll hire a PhD in computer science. And that person will be responsible for making sure that um, this thing hasn't already been done before, that there's some interesting publication that can come out of it. Um, and um, there's going to be a real engineer working on it as well. So that'll be somebody like Jin, who has maybe 10 years of 
um, software development experience developing products and sort of can keep to a schedule and actually make sure the thing works. And then I think we'll have uh, one or two junior people on each project who are you know, programming and helping make it happen. So that's kind of be, going to be the structure of the lab, I think. What other projects are Well, this is one of them. Uh, I mean, it's hard to, there's, there's two approaches to this. You know, one way to say is, okay, we're going to be the corporate research lab and we'll take the company business plan and we'll just do things that are related to that. I think that's usually pretty hard because, you know, any company that's not insane will have real engineers working on their actual problems. And for you to go stick your nose into those things, you're not likely to contribute much. Um, the second thing is you have to take a leaf from the good lab directors. If you look at Nicholas Negroponte at the Media Lab, you know he doesn't have this big list. Here's the authorized things you could work on in the Media Lab. Uh, you know he tries to find the best people he can. Uh, I guess he's sort of retired now, but when he was building it, he tried to find the best people that he could. And you know he had kind of some overarching themes, but pretty much once somebody was in the Media Lab, they could work on whatever they wanted. You know you have to rely on the creativity of your people, you know, there's, no, there's no individual person that's ever going to be creative enough to uh, have a great research lab like Xerox Park. Oh, and I guess we have a theory about why this lab won't suck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the reason Xerox Park sucked in the end was that uh, the impedance mismatch between Xerox Park and the rest of Xerox was enormous. So basically, uh, it was very hard for an idea to get from Palo Alto into Rochester. So I think that the Orange Research Lab is part of a group that has a $500 million venture capital fund as well. So they are responsible for investing all this venture capital and pursuing uh, a research program. And the idea is that, well, we may have some ideas that could be spun out into small companies funded by this venture capital fund and then taken up by this, you know, big company that has 30 million wireless subscribers. So that's that, that's our theory on, you know, why if you come work at this lab, you know, you're not just going to be stuck away for the rest of your life doing irrelevant stuff. And then the other thing we're doing is tighter, very tight coupling to MIT, basically trying to be a little bit humble and say, well, you know, if we're going to build something great like Xerox Park, you know, it's not going to happen this week. This week. So we might as well partner with MIT groups. So for speech apps, we're going to partner heavily with Victor Zhu's group at the Lab for Computer Science, which built that, that weather, that conversational speech system I mentioned yesterday for doing weather. Um, it's linked from Eve's voice XML article if you want to try it out. So that's another theory of mine. But yeah, I am trying to be patient. It's going slower than I would like. Um, if I want to look at other online communities other than photo.net mm -hmm. and slash dot, I'm not really familiar with many. With many? Yeah. Well, there's, you know, you know good ones? plan it out. <laughs> we mentioned them yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have to pick your topic first, right? If you pick aquariums, I can maybe give you a few examples. But, I mean, ultimately, you're going to have to go to Yahoo and surf around and see what's happening. I don't think it'll take you more than an hour. I don't think it would take anybody who... Started the if you if you started with the idea of photography, I don't think it would take you more than an hour to find photo.net. Um, in fact, let's see how long it takes on Google. Because there's online communities if they're programmed properly, you know their discussion forums will overwhelm the search engines and they'll dominate the photography. UCR, American Museum, New York Institute. Well, I'm not doing so good here. Um, Center for Creative Photography. Photo links. I'm betting it would be here. I'm hoping. American Photography. Amateur. For, this is sad. Photo.net. All right. Well, that didn't take an hour. Well, maybe it would have if you'd followed every link. Uh, let's try, I'm interested in aquariums, right? So uh, let's limit it to, actually, let's talk about African cichlids. Let's see how long it takes to find an online community related to fish. Pets warehouse, email, home video, GeoCities. What? What? <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> check out my sponsor. Um, Cichlid Network. That sounds like a retailer more than anything else, or a breeder. Cichlid Recipe. That doesn't sound good. <laughs> like um, uh, community.webshots, that's like some picture thing, I think. Um, African Aquatics, um, Fish Maniac, what about this? Oh, actually, it looks again like a retailer of some sort. African Cichlid Community, you think? Well, unfortunately, that's a term of art in the aquarium world, right? There's the aquarium community tank is what you're going to get. People talking about a community tank with a lot of different ones. So, aquariumhobbyist.com forum, okay. So, this is apparently some sort of community. It might be good, it might be bad. And even if it's not very popular, one thing you can say, you can try to figure out, well, why hasn't this one, you know, which of the six elements did they skimp on? And uh, where did that land them? I go to cdips.com. I have 500 people in my community. On swimming? No, it's nothing. <laughs> Tedums.com? Yeah. Tracy's huge. <laughs> <laughs> Are you lying? <laughs> Learn to swim? Or the FAQ forum? What, which one? Nothing. They just sign up and there's basically nothing there. <laughs> yeah, well, this is. All right, so. <laughs> so, which principle did Tracy violate? <laughs> Yeah, a little, a little lacking on the content. Anyway. <laughs> All right, so uh, get those Oracle exercises done, really, by everybody should have them done by today at the latest. If you can't, you know, if you're having trouble, use the TAs, use your other students, use another student's box, right? So if you can't, you know, get them, you don't want to spend your whole life installing Oracle. It's certainly possible. Um, if you really can't get it to work, uh, SSH into somebody else's box, and then when the .NET machine comes, use that. Um, but you know, find a way to to get the or at least the Oracle exercises all done by today.